Hi everyone, welcome to Miss Adams Teaches Poetry. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at Carol Ann Duffy's poem, War Photographer. Carol Ann Duffy is a very, very famous poet of our time. She was actually Poet Laureate for 10 years between 2009 and 2019. Uh, this particular poem of hers was written in 1985, uh, perhaps influenced by the fact that she was good friends with two different war photographers, so would have had a little bit of insight into the kind of difficulties of uh, their jobs, both recording um, these kind of horrific events and also being quite sort of distanced from it as well, not being able to sort of do anything other than bring that message home. This poem was written in 1985, so just 10 years after the Vietnam War. Um, <clears throat> and there's some of the imagery in here could actually make you think of some of those um, images, those photographs that did appear from that time as part of the kind of anti-war campaign. It's an incredibly powerful poem. And so, without further ado, let's get started with our analysis. Okay, let's look at the title, War Photographer. There's a certain sense of anonymity created in this title. It obviously introduces us to the topic of the poem, but you'll notice that it's not the war photographer. It's just war photographer, so it could be anyone doing this role, despite the fact that we know that Caroline Duffy was friends with a couple of different war photographers who perhaps inspired this poem. The poem begins creating a sense of isolation, but relief in that isolation, like solace in being alone. In his dark room, he is finally alone. So it, this, the line begins with this uh, frontal adverbial in his dark room. So creating quite a close, small setting, certainly a dark setting. But it's the adverb finally that shows us that there's a sense of relief that he's been waiting for this moment despite the fact that clearly the process is still one that involves trauma and a sense of suffering. We have this metaphor with spools of suffering set out. Note that sibilance within the metaphor as well. So the spools are obviously the, the, the reels of photos that the camera has produced, but it's metaphorical because it's spools of suffering, like every picture is an is a specific kind of um, image of suffering. And then we get the idea of them being set out in ordered rows. So that's part of his process. Um, but there's this interesting idea um, with this juxtaposition between the chaos of what's in the photos and the structure that he's putting them in, almost like he's needing to make sense out of them or find a way to create some structure after what he has been through and after what he has witnessed. The only light is red and softly glows as though this were a church and he a priest preparing to intone a mass. You've got to look at those three lines together because of the enjambement. Make sure you always read through the lines. Don't take don't take them in isolation. But we've got this really interesting analogy here, comparing his dark room to a church and comparing him as the photographer uh, to a priest, which tells us a number of things. You can say that the whole kind of process in itself is a sacred one, that there is a sort of spirituality and like a, a priest will be sharing a message, you could argue that his photographs are part of that message. Um, you've got language that's associated with religion to back this up. Obviously, you've got priest, church, intone, because intone is the recital of uh, when if you in, you intone a prayer, you recite a prayer. And obviously, you've got mass. Um, there is something very kind of soothing in this environment. You know, the idea of the red light and the soft glowing, it's not harsh like the images of war. Um, so again, creating the sense of the sacred space, but you probably could think about the notion of the color red. And yes, you could think about the red tabernacle within the church, but you might also be reminded of the kind of bloodshed um, that is in um, the photographs. Another interpretation of this analogy is almost like in every photograph he presents or prepares, it's a form of remembrance, like this is an aspect of the funeral of all of those people that died, that he is creating a kind of funeral for them or a respect for them through his photographs. And then we get this series of minor sentences or one word sentences, Belfast, Beirut, Phnom Penh. Now, these are proper nouns. They are places war-torn places um, that are, are very, very well known. So Belfast 
is in Northern Ireland, Beirut and Lebanon, Phnom Penh and Cambodia. Um, but we're listing places of war, places of suffering, the kinds of things that will be in his pictures. And then this biblical allusion, all flesh is grass. Um, now that is an expression from the Old Testament, Isaiah, I believe, um, although it is referenced somewhere in the New Testament, but the idea behind all flesh is grass, is the idea that death is inevitable, uh, that life is short. Flesh uh, is representative of, of people, of, but it, it's it's almost dehumanizing them in, in making them almost just like meat, just the bodies. And it's the idea of like um, circle of life, sort of fertilizing the soil. And there's a kind of suggestion that death is, is commonplace. But the biblical illusion fits with the other religious analogy of the dark room being like a church as well. Slight shift in tone as we move into the second stanza. It opens with a, a, a very simple, uh, quite blunt declarative statement. He has a job to do. Now, the, the idea of calling it a job, it gives it a uh, function, it gives it purpose. It's perhaps a justification for his actions, um, which is something that we will go on to consider in the third stanza as well, whether there needs to be a sense of justification, whether there is a kind of moral issue or an ethical issue to do with war photography. Uh, we have this homonymic pun, solution slop and tray. So I say homonymic pun because that word has got two different meanings, even though it's spelt the same and sounds the same. So solution, slopping, is the um, the liquid that um, you're going to develop the for the photographs in but you can also think of solution as in a solution to a problem and if you read it that way um then there's a kind of carelessness about it they're slopping solutions are slopping around like is there a solution to these walls can we find them in the images no we can't it's too it's too haphazard it's too chaotic um or you've got the idea that they're slopping in the tray in the actual moment because of the shaking of his hands. So solution slops and trays beneath his hands, which did not tremble then, though seem to now. Notice where the enjambement, run on line, uh, places the focus, the last part of that uh, line, uh, or that thought or utterance, though seem to now. So it's bringing it back to the present day. Now you might ask, well, why is it that his hands are trembling now rather than there where he's seeing? All of the violence and it is perhaps to do with this idea he has a job to do so whilst he's out there he has to shut himself down he has to be emotionless he's just got to take the photos when he's back home the trauma sets in and his shakes come in and in this idea about being back in the moment we have another minor sentence rural England note the adjective rural so it's the kind of idealized version of England rather than the bit busy cities it, it's the sweeping rolling countryside home again to ordinary pain which simple weather can dispel so we've got this oxymoron ordinary pain which is really about highlighting the things that we moan about in england the things that we say cause us problems or difficulties in comparison to the world of war is just ordinary, it's commonplace, and actually simple weather can, can dispel. Um, you know, you have a sunny day and suddenly everything's much better. And that is in stark juxtaposition to the incredibly emotive imagery um, and emotive language that comes in the following couple of lines, to fields which don't explode beneath the feet of running children in a nightmare heat. So again, rural England and fields are linked together, but he's saying our fields are stationary. They don't explode. There is no risk in rural England. But this image is made more emotive because he talks about the concept of running children, um, which obviously makes it so much more horrifying because it's focusing on youth. It might make you think of that um, very famous, very harrowing image that came out of the Vietnam War of the little girl uh, running down the road um, naked after a, a napalm bomb. Um, and bearing in mind um, that this poem was written only sort of 10-ish 
uh, years after the Vietnamese War. I mean, it is possible that Karen Ann Duffy is really wanting you to kind of imagine that kind of harrowing scene, an image that we are all very familiar with. And then we've got this horribly emotive metaphor, nightmare heat. It, it makes it sound like, well, like hell, let's be honest. So massive uh, contrast or juxtaposition between the ordinary pain that weather can dispel, like that weather can get rid of, you know, in normal uh, rural England. OK, so this stanza starts with a, another simple declarative, another kind of blunt declarative here something is happening now that's left quite broad and quite open as to what it is that's happening but obviously he's developing the photographs as we go so one interpretation is it is it, it's this moment that in the solution an image is appearing right in front of his eyes and it's a stranger's feature no stranger's features note there's a sense of distance pointing out that it's a stranger Karen Ann Duffy is being quite clear to show that there's no relationship between the war photographer and the person or people that he is taking photos of um, a stranger's features faintly start to twist before his eyes so that verb twist is quite interesting here it could be because of the movement of the solution that the image sort of looks like it's twisting under the water but it might be a metaphor it might actually be about the notion of pain so as the picture of the person the man appears you can see the twisting of pain on his face and then you've got another metaphor here a half-formed ghost Again, two interpretations there. It's half formed because the photo is still developing, but it could be because as he was taking this photograph, the man was dying or about to die. And so this notion of half dead, half formed ghost. So again, another, you know, highly emotive image. He remembers the cries of this man's wife. So notice how we're now kind of focusing more on the memories. So just going back to this, something is happening. Yes, of course, it's a photo being developed, but it's also something happening in his mind. There's a stirring up of memories. So he remembers the cries of this man's wife, how he sought approval without words to do what someone must. OK, so I mentioned before about the notion of justifying his actions when he said he has a job to do. And again, we've got another little hint of whether or not there's a kind of ethical debate here about the work that's being done. So it's, you know, yes, someone needs to be there telling the story, but these are also very private moments. So he wants to seek approval. He wants to ask if this is OK to capture this moment as this man is dying. But because they don't share a language, it is without words. So it is ambiguous as to whether or not he found approval, whether it was OK with the woman to take a photo of her husband as he was dying. But we've got this modal verb here, must, what someone must. So again, it's another form of justification. Even if there are slight ethical issues, he's saying that his role is important, that this knowledge of what's going on in other places has to be shared at home. And how the blood stained into foreign dust. So another kind of little bit of the um, <clears throat> the memory here. But I think the idea of staining, the blood staining, uh, is really important and quite symbolic. Like it's the kind of lasting effect. So it could be about his memories as well. And another kind of biblical allusion, foreign dust. The fact that because you know you think about funeral, uh, the the language of funeral, dust to dust. Um, ashes to ashes so another kind of link to the sort of religious ceremony of it all okay um last stanza of the poem a hundred agonies in black and white so i've written hyperbole question mark because you might debate you might say actually no it, that's not hyperbole you know it's very uh, general do you know what I mean it's a round number which perhaps suggests that it's not meant to be specific and it is certainly showing vastness but actually when you think about it deeply you might think oh well actually no that's probably quite realistic which enhances the idea of suffering and his choice of um saying in black and white is quite interesting because depending on what kind of um era we're imagining this being told you know we might have black and white photos we might have color photos they might be stylistically black and white 
which is slightly uncomfortable as well because it means that you're editing suffering in order to make it look more appealing or worse or more harrowing or more dramatic so the kind of doctoring but you could also look at it as black and white um sometimes it's used as um an expression to mean straightforward you know there's nothing to think about which is obviously ironic because there is nothing black and white about these images and the responses to these images and then that kind of I suppose irony is created more through this juxtaposition because you've got a hundred agonies in black and white from which his editor will pick out five or six. So you've got the juxtaposition between the hundred and then the very specific five or six. And think about how limited that is for the Sunday supplement. And again, we've got our clever use of enjambement putting the focus on Sunday supplement. So again, we've got this idea about being selective with other people's grief and suffering and we're being reminded that this is as much as you know the, the from the perspective of the war photographer of the subject this is something that has to be done we're being reminded that this is also for profit the fact that it's in the sunday supplement as well as opposed to the the normal daily um newspaper it's in the weekend paper where everyone's very relaxed and you know so there's a slightly it's the beginning of this sort of callous tone that Carol Ann Duffy is creating in relation to the people back home, observing the photos and reading the articles. And onto that, the reader's eyeballs prick with tears. I find the use of the noun eyeballs really strange. It's highly specific, it's very clinical, and I think we're meant to be getting that sort of distance. Carol Ann Duffy doesn't write that their hearts are torn, it's their eyeballs. So they take it in, they see it, and they prick with tears. So a very short response. <laughs> and they prick with tears between bath and pre-lunch beers. So we've got this internal rhyme that almost creates a sort of jokey, almost sort of whimsical tone, tears between bath and pre-lunch beers and the bath and the pre-lunch beers are these sort of like Sunday routines so you imagine you know you have your Sunday morning in bed you read the Sunday supplements then you get in the bath and you have a little think about it before you open up your bit so what Duffy is doing here is creating what we call bathos and that is like a the use of deliberate understatement to almost create anti-climax like we've had all of this horror described to us and then yeah, the people back home, they might just not even shed a tear, just their eyes might well up before they go off and have their their pre-lunch beer uh, for their Sunday routine. And then we get a shift in time um, to a kind of, we're still in this present tense, but it's a kind of future time of him being back on an aeroplane, going to another war-torn country. So there's this idea of the events of the poem being cyclical. It's not a cyclical structure, it's not, it's not repeating the opening stanza, but it's the events themselves that seem like a cycle. He comes back, he develops the photos, they get published, off he goes back up to another uh, war-torn country. So from the aeroplane, he stares impassively. Impassively, this adverb means um, not feeling any emotion. So there's a suggestion of numbness. Now that's interesting because all the way through the poem, as Duffy describes his actions in the dark room, he's clearly emotional. So this is perhaps alluding to the fact that he has to turn off his emotions in order to go back to these war-torn countries. A bit more irony is created again, where he earns a living. So it's a reminder, just like with the Sunday supplements line, that he too is profiting from it. And he makes a living, this is where the irony comes in, out of photographing the death of um, his subjects. But the real damning kind of end and the depressing end, it's, it's not necessarily on that. I don't think we're meant to be, um, I don't think we're meant to be sort of um, criticising the war photographer himself, but it's the other people they do not care. So we've got this nice broad general third person pronoun, they, 
Um, and again, that's who is that? It's the outside world. It's the people back at home. It's the editors not caring that he has to do this yeah, to make a living. But again, in his idea, it, it must be done. This this kind of message again must be shown. Oh, what a depressing poem, hey? Quick notes on form. Um, so obviously we've got uh, four stanzas, um, six lines. And we do have a regular rhyme, but it's it's quite a tricky one. So it's A, B, B, C, D, D. And every now and then sometimes it's slight like half rhymes. But that is kept all the way through um, this this rhyme scheme. Yet when you read it, because of all of the enjambement and all of the caesura, any building rhythm or rhyme is sort of broken up. And I think this is, again, about this idea of chaos and order. Um, or structure and chaos, the idea of making sense out of something that is so chaotic and difficult to understand. Um, so the form is sort of symbolic or mimetic of, of that conflict between order and chaos in the poem. That's it from me. Uh, sorry about how depressing that one was, but what you're going to do, it's called War Photographer. Um, if you've got any questions, give me a shout, just drop them in the comments and I will get back to you. Um, otherwise, hope everything is going well with your work. Happy revising.